we want to move into our Bible study. We're almost done with chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians. And a matter of fact, we're, we're, we have very little really to discuss. So we'll finish that up for certain tonight. Um, but before we do, let's just go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you, God, for this evening. Lord, we are so grateful for the word of God, the bread of life. Lord, this wonderful sacred document that you've given to the church so that we might have a written reference where we might find wisdom, instruction, advice, counsel, encouragement, inspiration. Master, as we look into this subject matter, the gifts of the Spirit, I pray, God, that you would help us to hunger, to be used of God, that you would allow us, Lord, to feel the desire to be used of the Holy Ghost for the benefit of God's church and for the benefit of your people. Master, tonight let the anointing flow even in this simple setting as we engage in our Bible study tonight. Let the teacher be anointed. Let the student be anointed. Allow every heart, Lord, to be cultivated that it might be ready to receive the word of God today. Help us, Lord, to be receptive. And Lord, today in the name of Jesus, every spirit, every hindrance that would work against this ministry today, every hindrance that would work against the work we're trying to do here in Huntsville, Alabama area, in the name of Jesus, we bind it upon the authority of God's word and we cast it forth as dumb in the name of Jesus. Master, move, bless, help, encourage, inspire, instruct today by the Holy Ghost. For we ask it all in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. I may do some little videos, um, not on Wednesday night, but just at different times and kind of share like my coming out experience and stuff just for our new people here in the Huntsville area, you know, so we can have that on our on our new church uh, uh, YouTube channel. By the way, we are broadcasting live today on YouTube. I don't know why all of a sudden it's working, but tonight it's so funny because tonight I just decided I was going to try to use our broadcast software and see if we couldn't. Um, broadcast to all the different places we broadcast on Sunday, and that includes uh, YouTube. But here lately, when we've tried to broadcast on YouTube, it never goes through. Well, all of a sudden tonight, it's working. So hallelujah, we're live on YouTube tonight. All right, we've been looking for the last couple of weeks, we've been looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, we talked about the fact that this is the Apostle Paul addressing a, a specific issue with a specific church, a specific body of people. The Corinthian church, much like the charismatic movement of the 60, uh, 70s and 80s, um, they wanted the manifestation of the Spirit, they wanted... Uh, the move of God, they wanted uh, the uh, euphoria and the joy and the, and the great uh, positivity that one experiences when the Spirit of the Lord is really moving in a church service. But with that comes great responsibility. I've always said, even in my early pastoral days, the charismatic movement is they want Pentecostal worship, but they don't want Pentecostal doctrine. They want to be able to worship like we worship, shout and dance and you know, run the aisles and talk in tongues, but they don't want the doctrine. They, they don't want sound biblical 
teaching that goes with that? Well, the problem is you have to have both. You cannot have. Th this is why the Lord Jesus Christ said, God is the spirit and they that worship him, listen carefully, must worship him in spirit and in truth. So you can't just have the spirit. You also have to have the truth. And sound doctrine and sound teaching is every bit as important as any move of God you can experience in the church or any perceived move of God because we were talking about it. A lot of the charismatic movement um, honestly began to use, uh, I'm going to say it plainly today, a counterfeit spirit. Uh, they tried to manufacture things that looked like the move of God. You know, manufacture people falling over when they're prayed for, and you know, all this foolishness. And we wind up with Benny Hinn, and most people today, uh, it, you don't even have to be a Christian. You watch Benny Hinn on TV, and you know it's a dog and pony show, you know it's a clown show, and um, it's, it's not legitimate. Now, I would, I would caution you not to think for a moment that the, the sort of things you see there don't really happen because the real thing does happen, okay? But uh, there are those who get so caught up in the manifestation and, and in a false spirituality. They think the more they talk in tongues or the more they shout and dance, or the more they fall over, or the more a preacher, you know, everybody he prays for falls over, that makes him more uh, spiritual, or it makes them more spiritual. This was the condition of the Corinthian church. And in the 14th chapter, the Apostle Paul addresses, he addresses the gifts of the Spirit as they operate in the church uh, he, he's giving the Corinthian church some very sound teaching and some very sound guidelines to go by in order to keep structure and in order to keep order in the church so that it not just fall into a state of chaos and confusion, okay? And uh, we got last time... Uh, we had gotten down to verse number 36. There are only 40 verses. So let me read for you now. Paul said, What came the word of God out from you, or came it unto you only? If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. Sorry about that. Get a tickle in my throat. So here Paul is once again, if you've watched our last couple of sessions, you know uh, we've talked about this. He's once again addressing this, this foolish notion of um, hyper spirituality, you know, uh, you know, you think because you talk in tongues every minute that you're in church that you're more spiritual than everybody else, or every time you come to church, boy, oh, the Lord's given me a prophetic word, hallelujah, or every time you come to church, God's given a message in tongues, and I've I've known people like this over the years. I've known people like this. Um, and honestly, I, I, I'm going to say again, uh, you folks that know me know, uh, the only way I know how to talk is plain. I'm not real good at talking in circles. Um, but I have seen people like this be a real frustration for pastors. Uh, somebody in the church, they, they just think every single time they come to church, they're supposed to give a message in tongues. 
Well, honey, guess what? God is not using that in every single service. It's not necessary in every single service. For one thing, again, if you look at what we were teaching on in past weeks, tongues and interpretation are specifically for who? The unbeliever. Guess what? Not every church service you attend is going to have unbelievers present. Am I telling the truth? There are many church services when uh, you may have visitors, but they're believers, you know. Uh, and there are many church services where the church house is all believers. They're all people who know, um, who understand the gifts of the Spirit, who understand the move of God. And guess what? If you are doing as you ought to be doing, and when it comes to worship, Jesus said, must worship in spirit and in truth. Well, to worship in spirit means that our worship has to be led by, inspired by, orchestrated by the Spirit of the Lord. So what happens is um, there are times in Pentecostal, Holy Ghost-filled uh, churches, you know, Spirit-filled churches, where the Spirit of the Lord will fall like rain. And I mean, folks, we'll have a good old-fashioned tongue-talking, shouting, dancing, running the house, church service like it's going out of style. And there are some who would say, well, that's inappropriate because Paul said, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, Paul said, if there be an unbeliever, but if you're letting the Spirit orchestrate the meeting, the Lord knows who's there. And if there's somebody there that is, is not going to get it, you know, it's going to be turned off or, you know, whatever by this, then he's not going to move in that way, in that service. But when you have a meeting and it's all believers and they're earnestly praying, just like in Scripture, look in the book of Acts when the believers get together and pray. And you know it was all God's people that were praying. And the Bible said the house was shaken where they were assembled. You know, things happen when God's people get together. And so this is why in a lot of uh, Pentecostal church services, you know, we have what, what I like to call, a, you know, a Holy Ghost blowout, you know. But it's because the Lord is in control and he knows who's there and he knows um, how to orchestrate that meeting, you know, for the benefit of those who are there. And if you've got a church full of Holy Ghost filled people, then, honey, there, there ain't nothing wrong with the Spirit moving and you're having a good shouting service. And you know what I'm saying? Okay. Uh, and I got to tell you, there are some times that God uses the, a good Holy Ghost service um, to even reach the unbeliever. You know, Paul talks about if there be an unbeliever there, how can he understand you're, you know, what you're saying because you're speaking in tongues and therefore you ought to speak in tongues certainly, but at the same time, you also ought to use your understanding as well. So there ought to be a balance. There ought to be a mixture. Nowhere, 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 nowhere did Paul ever say that in worship you were not allowed to speak in tongues. Nowhere did Paul ever suggest that. No, he made it abundantly clear. I will pray with the Spirit. I will pray with my understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit. I will sing with my understanding also. So all he was saying was, no, there has to be some form of balance. There has to be some form of of. Um, uh, equity, you know, uh, you can't just go off in one direction. And, you know, there's a reason why in our um, broadcast church services that things don't happen the way they might if we actually had a church full of people. And uh, that is because 
we're broadcasting. There, God knows who's going to watch that service. The Lord knows who's going to see it. And uh, so therefore, he's going to orchestrate it in such a manner so that it can effectively reach uh, those that are going to see it. So Paul here is talking about this false sense of spirituality, this false sense of what I refer to as hyper-spirituality. What, you know, came the word of God out from you? So what, you know, what do you think? You guys are the origin of this thing? He said, or came it up to you only? Or are you the only people that God sent the Holy Ghost to? You know, and uh, he's making that reference to that, that hyper-spirituality mentality. And then he said, if any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. So he said, if you're really spiritual, then you're going to recognize that I am giving you good, godly counsel. I'm giving you good, godly guidelines that nothing I'm offering you is not something that has been um, inspired of the Holy Ghost to offer you. Okay. Then he said, but if any man be ignorant, listen, let him be ignorant. So Paul's not, you know, it's so funny. In fundamentalism, they love to argue with people, and they'll try to argue with you and break you down, break you down, break you down, till finally you agree with them, or at least you feign agreement with them. I grew up in fundamentalism. I know what I'm talking about. If any of you that have grown up around Southern Baptists, they are the worst. They are the absolute worst. They call it witnessing. It's not witnessing. It's hounding. They will pound on people and pound on people and pound on people and pound on people till finally you say, yeah, 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 okay, I agree with you. Yeah, I see it, uh -huh, you know. And... Uh, but you'll notice Paul doesn't approach things from that perspective. He's not trying to beat people into submission. He's not trying to beat them into agreeing. He's going to listen. If you're spiritual, you're going to recognize that what I'm saying is from the Lord. Say, but you know what? If you're ignorant, stay ignorant. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? He's not trying to beat them. You know, and and if you don't see this, then you need to pray, bless God, and you need to find out that what I'm. You know, you need to really. You know, uh, you need to submit to me because I'm an apostle and I said so. No, that's not the approach Paul takes at all. He doesn't take an authoritarian approach. He says, no, but if you're ignorant, be ignorant. Basically, for, for most of us preachers and pastors and prophets and whoever else, we recognize that um, sometimes spiritually people just haven't arrived yet. They haven't grown up yet. You know, they haven't matured yet. So it's like, well, you know what? If you're ignorant, then be ignorant because that's only a temporary state of existence anyway. You may as you grow in the Lord, as you've been in this thing longer, you'll outgrow that. You know, you'll learn. You'll you'll finally come around after a while. But I'm not going to stand here and argue with you. I'm not going to stand here and debate with you. I'm not going to stand here trying to beat you into submission either. You know, at some point, you just have to let people be where they're at. That's the thing. Sometimes you just have to let people be where they're at. Then he said in verse 39, Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy. In other words, desire to prophesy. Listen to the next phrase. And forbid not to speak with tongues. So clearly, <laughs> my Baptist friends, some of y'all probably think I'm real hard on Baptists. I am. I am. Uh, I'm born and raised in the Pentecostal movement. I have had a lot of experience in my lifetime with Southern Baptist. I'm going to say Southern Baptist. See, a, a lot of people don't understand. Most of your, your black Baptist churches are basically spirit-filled churches. They're, they use the term Baptist, but they don't, they don't believe the same way that a white Southern Baptist church believes. 
And that, you know, so you, you really got to understand that. I understand that. I have a habit of talking about Baptists, you know, and a black Baptist uh, person might be listening and think, well, you know, I'm Baptist, you know. Well, honey, that y'all use that term, but you're really more Pentecostal than you are Baptist, you know. Um, the black folk use the term Baptist entirely different than the way white folks do. The white Baptist or the Southern Baptist movement is one of the most perverse, Bible-twisting movements on the face of the planet. And I told you, I'm going to talk plain. I don't have time to talk any other way. I have debated with uh, Southern Baptist preachers and members and different ones over the years. I have been mistreated and done dirty like you can't believe by Southern Baptists. I, I could go down a litany, a list of experiences that I've had in my lifetime with Southern Baptists, you know, from attending a, a private school uh, it, during my early high school years that was run by a Southern Baptist church. It was the only one that was near us where we lived, and my mother put us in this school run by Southern Baptist. And um, my teacher come to me at the end of the year because it was an ACE school. For those of you who are familiar with ACE, curriculum, the Accelerated Christian Education curriculum. It was an ACE school. And at the end of the year, they give out uh, these little trophies and awards for a variety of different things, you know, most improved student and blah, blah, blah. The idea being to encourage the kids, you know, to, to strive to improve and blah, 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 blah. Well, one of the Awards they give out each year is the most uh, the most Christ-like student. And my teacher, uh, who was the assistant pastor of this church, um, the principal was the pastor of the church. My teacher came to me and he said, Chuck, he said, I want to talk to you before we have the award ceremony, whatever night it was going to be. And he said, um, all of the teachers, all of the instructors in this school um, nominated and wanted you to get the award for the most Christ-like student. He said, honestly, you are the most devout and the most um, passionate young person that I've ever known and you know you have a wonderful testimony and you you really try to live your life uh, the way the Lord would have you to live it and he said and all of the teachers recognized this and uh, he said every one of us wanted you to get that award he said but you're not going to get it and I said okay you know no problem he said, uh, Pastor Perry, who was the principal of the school as well as the pastor of the church, said that he's not about to give that award to a Pentecostal student. Nope, that award has to go to a Baptist student. So they gave the award to a young lady in the, in the school um, who the teachers didn't seem to be aware of this, but us students were aware of it. Um, my brother Michael had been with her sexually, and so had half the guys in the school. Because this girl was loose as a goose and out there doing all kinds of stuff. But she was a member of Brother Perry's church, and she played piano when we had our little chapel sessions. So, you know, she was going to get the award for the most Christ-like. Uh, I've worked for people. I worked for a man in Fort Worth when I first moved to Fort Worth. I got a job in a Safeway, and the manager of that Safeway gave me the hardest time. Oh, my goodness, he rode me like a horse. 
And then one day he told me flat out, he said, I hate Pentecostals. I can't stand Pentecostals. And that was the whole reason he was writing. He was a Southern Baptist man. Uh, I have never seen a movement that goes so far out of its way to twist and contort the Word of God as the Southern Baptist movement. If you watch movies like Southern Baptist Sissies, if you watch um, a lot of these things on YouTube where LGBT people have been so deeply hurt and destroyed. If you look at poor Leslie Jordan, um, his story, um, it, that man spiritually was destroyed by the Southern Baptist Church. And it amazes me at how destructive that movement is. So uh, I do reference a lot of times things because they are running around teaching false doctrine. And they are telling their people all kinds of false information. And it is my job, part of my job is to set the, re the record straight. And I love, in, in my conversations with Southern Baptists over the years, they've cracked me up because they'll sit there and say, well, that isn't real. The, the, them people talking in tongues, that isn't God, that isn't real, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then they'll turn around like good old uh, Trump, and they'll go to a whole different argument. Well, and even if it were, Paul said, I'd rather speak, you know, uh, five words with my understanding than 10,000 words without it and blah, 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 blah. And yeah, Paul said that, but he had a whole lot else, he had a whole lot more to say than that. And nowhere, nowhere in his teaching did Paul say that you shouldn't speak in tongues in the course of a worship service or in the course of worship. Nowhere, nowhere does he say that. As a matter of fact, he says plainly, um, yes, I'll pray with the Spirit, but I'll pray with my understanding also. I'll sing with my Spirit, I'll sing with my understanding also. He says here plainly, forbid not to speak with tongues. So Paul clearly is saying here, he's talking to a church that has had an issue with getting this all right, okay, and and, and doing everything right. But Paul turns around and says, for everything I've just taught you and everything I've just said, I don't want you to be telling people now they shouldn't be speaking in tongues. Do you know what I'm saying? So, but boy, them, them Southern Baptists, they'll pull out whatever they want to pull out to try to make their little point, and they ignore the whole. They ignore the context they ignore uh, the, uh, everything else that comes with that passage that they're trying to pull out of context. And folks, that is not the proper way to handle the Word of God. So we've got to be careful about that foolishness, okay? All right, so Paul ends the 14th chapter of the book of 1 Corinthians by saying, let all things be done decently and in order okay and so this is why there is a structure this is why he said if if one's prophesying and somebody else starts prophesying then you stop because you want to keep order you you know you don't want to have people shouting over each other you know and it becoming confusion and it becoming a contest of spirituality you know uh, but the person who starts prophesying after you're already in the middle of prophesying they may actually be a less spiritual person who's who's jumping the gun or or speaking out of water but for the sake of order and decency, the more spiritual person who is speaking at the moment needs to stop and yield to them. 
just for the sake of maintaining order. Do you follow what I'm saying? So order in the church is very important. And it's even interesting when the spirit moves in a church service, you know, and, and you have a real Holy Ghost blowout. It's really interesting because you see you see how the Spirit of the Lord orchestrates this so that, you know, it's it's not just one person jumping up and shouting, screaming and hollering and running around the church and, you know, hooting. But no, when the Spirit moves, you know, it's like a wave and it affects the entirety of the body. Now, everybody doesn't have the same reaction, but everybody is affected by it and everybody's kind of invested in it, okay? Uh, there may be some who remain uh, silent and pray, you know, quietly to themselves while the Spirit's moving, but they're still in the groove, you know what I'm saying? And uh, everybody doesn't have to act out the same way. Everybody doesn't have to be demonstrative in the same way. But... You don't have the one person while the spirit's moving and people are shouting and you you don't have one person sitting there saying, What on earth's going on? I don't get this. This is really, you know what? Oh, for crying out loud. You know, no. Everybody's in that groove, you know. And uh, they are um, they're simply um, approaching things the way they approach things, but they're in the spirit and they're in the groove. Okay. Now Having talked about that, we're going to move into a couple of the gifts specifically. We're going to talk a little bit about some of the gifts specifically. But since the 14th chapter of the book of 1 Corinthians is primarily dealing with um, the issue of speaking with other tongues, I thought that it would be wise to first cover a couple of passages that deal with speaking in tongues. And so we can understand the dynamic of that a little bit better. Um, in Romans, see if I can get up here. In Romans chapter 8, for instance, In Romans chapter 8 and verse 26 and 27, the Apostle Paul said, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, meaning our weaknesses, our, our struggles, our difficulties that we go through. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. There are times you're going through stuff and you really, you really don't know what to pray for. I'll be honest with you, I've experienced this more in the last 30 years than I've experienced in my life. There are times I'm so depressed and down and discouraged and despondent. I just don't even know what to, I don't even know what to ask the Lord for. I, I really don't even know. I am so beat down and battered that I don't even know what to ask the Lord for. And he said, um, likewise the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. He said, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. So the Holy Ghost will inspire in our spirit, sometimes literally, just groans, just a sound. Because we don't know what to say. We have no clue what to say. Have you, you ever had somebody say to you, what do you think of that Trump? And you go, mm -hmm. You don't give them a word to answer, do you? No, but you give them a groan, you give them a sound. And boy, that conveys to them what you're feeling, doesn't it? Uh, Tamala Mann, on a, one of the videos we had before church, uh, I liked, before church, I had made a bunch of different videos with different uh, gospel singing and things 
um, that I play, and that's kind of to get us in the spirit of prayer and ready for church. And one of them, uh, Tamil, a man who I love, is singing the uh, Take Me to the King. And at one point in the song, if you remember, she says something about uh, if, if, if you don't know what to pray, if you don't know what to say, she said, well, we'll make this our battle cry. And she just lets out this kind of a noise or sound, you know. And uh, that's, in essence, that's exactly what she's doing. She's saying, you know, when you don't know what else to pray, whatever, just go, you know. And I can't remember what that, that sound is she makes. I can't think of what it is. But anyway, you know, it's just, it's just kind of a groan or, you know. And so there are times, even when you're in prayer, even when you're by yourself and you're praying, and you just don't know what else to pray. You don't know what to say. And you just say, oh, God. Oh, oh, Jesus, you know. And you just groan. And God, folks, the Lord is so much more in tune with us than we give him credit for. If you think you need to put your feelings, if you think you need to put what you're going through into words for God to understand you, you're wrong. He gets you, even when all you can let out is a groan, even when all you can do is sit in his presence and weep. There's an old song I like to sing, tears are a language God understands. Even when all you can do is, is kneel or stand in his presence and weep, God understands what's going on in your heart. He understands what you're trying to convey to him. Okay, and then Paul goes on to say, And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit. Now, mind you, the word spirit here is capitalized. So it's not the mind of your spirit, but rather the mind of God's Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. One of the interesting things, when we pray in the Spirit and when we are uh, genuinely in the Spirit, the Spirit of the Lord is helping us to pray. Now again, it's your Spirit speaking, okay? God is not speaking through you as such. But the Spirit of the Lord is inspiring your spirit, helping your spirit to pray. And when we pray in the Spirit, the Word of God says, the one who knows the mind of God, which of course is God, God knows his own mind, he said he helps us to pray, how? According to the will of God. So when you pray in the Spirit, there's actually an advantage there's something very positive happening there. Because while you may not know how to put into prayer, uh, put into words what you ought to be praying for, the Spirit of the Lord does. He knows what you ought to be praying for. And he inspires your spirit to pray for those very things. So when you pray in the Spirit, you are literally praying specifically according to the exact will and purpose and plan of God. So that makes praying in the Spirit a very important, very positive exercise. Then in Jude's writing, in Jude chapter 1, verses 20 through 21, or I'm sorry, verse 20, uh, Jude says, But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. When we pray in the Spirit, we are building ourselves up. We are literally, it, I, I, <laughs> it's kind of hard to explain this, but um, I'm, I'm thinking of it in terms of how someone that doesn't yet have the Holy Ghost could understand it. 
uh, people that have the Holy Ghost, I know you understand it. Uh, I understand it. Uh, there are times you'd be so broken and so damaged and so hurt and so depressed and so despondent, and the Holy Ghost will just uh, inspire you to begin to pray in the Spirit, and you'll begin to pray in the Holy Ghost and praying in the Spirit. And after a while, you come out of that just feeling like you have put on a suit of armor and you can conquer the world. It literally strengthens you spiritually. It literally, this is why I say the Corinthian church kind of got caught away with it. Well, part of the reason is because there, the benefits of it are wonderful. There are great benefits, but... Uh, but Paul in 1 Corinthians 14 is talking specifically about corporate worship environments. He's not talking about when you're praying at home by yourself. You know, you can talk in tongues from the minute you get down to pray to the minute you finish when you're at home. If, if that's what you're, you're, you know, you feel inspired in your spirit to do. But in corporate worship, Paul's addressing, you know, how things ought to be handled because there needs to be structure, there needs to be order. Um, but Jude says, you know, building up yourselves on your most holy faith. If there's anything in the world that renews your faith and your confidence in God, uh, it is... Uh, having the Spirit of the Lord touch your spirit and you just begin to purge yourself and, you know, you just begin to let um, your prayer, your worship, your praise uh, flow from you through the Spirit, you know. And it does have a very, very uplifting and beneficial um, impact on the believer. So, you know, I talk about all the time, it for people that don't yet have the Holy Ghost, you ought to want the Holy Ghost because there are benefits, there are absolute benefits to um, having the gift of the Holy Ghost that you cannot experience. You know, it brings you into an intimacy with God that you cannot know. And, you know, always makes me laugh because a lot of people, you know, you can feel the presence of the Lord. You can go into church and you can really feel the presence of the Lord. And sometimes you feel the presence of the Lord in a very powerful, wonderful way. And yet people will kind of get it in their head that, well, boy, you know, but I feel it so wonderfully and so powerfully. I'm sure that this has ever been as good. Oh, no, it ain't. It gets way better than that. And uh, the, the baptism of the Holy Ghost is just like baptism in water. It is an immersion. You know, Jesus said, out of their belly shall flow rivers of living water. And uh, it is... Uh, God literally placing the source within you. So instead of you having to go to a well and drink water from the well, the well is inside of you, and the water, like an artesian, just keeps pouring forth. And so um, the baptism of the Holy Ghost has absolute wonderful advantage. It helps you to pray according to the will of God. It builds you up. Uh, you know, it, it helps you to become empowered, to feel empowered, and um, it brings you into a much deeper place of intimacy with God. And uh, it is a, a wonderful, wonderful thing. And it helps you to experience and to feel the virtues of God in a much more powerful way. And, and what I mean by that is, what are God's virtues? Well, first of all, God is love, number one. And the baptism of the Holy Ghost honestly helps you folks. It, it will allow you and cause you and help you to feel love. And it will help you um, 
to love your spouse better. It'll help you to love your neighbor better. It'll help you to love that person in the church that drives you up the wall better. You know, my Aunt Dorothy used to tell the story years ago. Um, she married a fellow who was real country. He was Texas country. And my uncle, uh, Travis, bless his heart, he was just as country. Tommy could tell you, he was as country as country could get. And uh, Aunt Dorothy married him, you know, and his folks, his mom and dad were like, hillbillies. They, they were real hick, you know, and they didn't have a whole lot of education and they, they you know, they, they um, in many ways, they were very ignorant people, you know, and my aunt just didn't much care for her mother-in-law, especially at all. And she said, oh man, she said, that, that old woman used to get on my last nerve. She said, I'd be around her and she'd be sitting there just to talking as ignorant and dumb and, you know, as you please. And I know it sounds mean, but this is what my aunt said, not me. And my aunt said that finally one day she realized, you know, uh, that the Lord wanted her and expected her to be able to love her mother-in-law. And so she began to pray and she said, Lord, help me to love this woman because as it stands, I just can't stand her. I, I can't even stand to be around her. And she said one day uh, her mother-in-law had come over. They brought her mother-in-law over. And she said, all of a sudden, she said, I, I didn't even realize that I, I didn't even uh, recognize that it had happened. She said, but I looked at my mother-in-law who was laying on our sofa kind of resting. And she said, and this, this absolute sense of compassion and love came over me. She said, I just felt this overwhelming sense of love and compassion for that woman. And she said, and do you know till the day she died, that I maintained that compassion and that love for that lady. She said, when my mother-in-law died, she said, I honestly was so hurt and grieved because I had genuinely come to really, really love that lady. The Spirit of God in, in our lives, folks, helps us to implement and to experience the virtues of God, compassion, love, grace, mercy, tolerance, patience, you know, and um, it, so it's so important, it is so important that we have uh, the presence of God not just around us, but in us. Amen. All right, so we are going to quickly look at a couple of the other gifts as well. Um, just for a little bit of clarity, we talked about, for instance, word of knowledge. And um, word of knowledge being when someone speaks something by the Holy Ghost that they would otherwise have no way in the world of knowing. God allows them to speak something that comes from his knowledge of our circumstance and our situation and, you know, and give us direction, guidance, encouragement, counsel, inspiration directly, but in, in such a manner that uh, you immediately recognize it as having come from the Lord. This is not something anybody would know. Uh, if God had not shown it to them. Um, the Lord spoke to me years ago. I was in a church in East Texas, and the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me to write the pastor a letter. And uh, he said, I've got some things I want to say to this pastor, and I want you to write him a letter. 
And so I sat down, and boy, I mean, the Spirit of the Lord anointed me to write this letter. And I wrote out, hand wrote out a letter. It was a good five, six pages of regular, you know, letter-sized uh, tablet paper, you know. And, um, and the Lord told me, he said, now share this with a couple of people close to you so that you have witnesses um, you know, you don't want to give this letter to the pastor and then the pastor turn around and say, well, he said this to me, he said that to me. And, and those things, those be accusations that are not true. So by sharing the letter with a couple of other people, one of them was another pastor in the same denomination who was a friend of mine. And the other person was a lady uh, that was my good friend at that time who had been a member of this man's church for 30 years. And um, I was a nervous wreck, I'll be honest with you. I was a nervous wreck giving this man this letter. There were a lot of things that the Lord spoke through me, a lot of things that I said that there's no way in the universe I could have known what I was saying if it wasn't for God, if it wasn't a word of knowledge. I was literally committing a word of knowledge to pen and paper. And uh, I gave this letter to uh, Sister Johnson and to the pastor, the other pastor, and they read it, and the other pastor came to me and he said, Brother, he said, dear God Almighty, if there was ever, if there ever was a word of knowledge that God gave somebody, he said, this letter is a word of knowledge. He knew the pastor. I, I had only been in the man's church a little while, and I'm going to say maybe a year. And there, the pastor's son had died. And he was actually, the son was actually about the age I was at the time. And uh, he had died before I ever got there. And they never talked about the son. They never, nobody in the church talked about this kid. And uh, I never saw a picture of him. I never, nobody hardly ever talked about him. But the pastor got up one Sunday and he preached a message and it was talking about basically when God um, does something that we don't agree with or, you know, we really would rather not have had it happen that way. And, uh, but we need to learn to accept it and blah, blah, blah. But the only problem is he referred to the death of his son and all this. And he used that as an example, you know. And the Spirit of the Lord, I'll never forget it as long as I live, the Spirit of the Lord just come up in me and I could feel this sense of, I don't want to say anger, but almost a sense of rebuke. And the Holy Ghost spoke to me and said, I spoke to him, the pastor. Before I took his son, he knew his son was going to die. He knew. I talked to him before his son died. And I literally asked him for permission. I wanted him to release his son. You know, I didn't want to take him. I wanted the, this man to release his son. So I spoke to him and told him, you know, um, your son is facing a very difficult life. He is facing a lot of hardships and a lot of trials and a lot of um, difficulties, a lot of hurts and pains. And if I take him now, then eternity will be secured. He'll be in heaven and he won't have to go through these things. And there, I'm, there's details I'm not sharing, folks. Um, I knew the Holy Ghost showed me a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, and so anyway, um, he had married a girl, and, and, and that girl literally um, 
backslid like basically the minute they got married and just turned into a hellion and had a baby and was causing all kinds of grief and, and that poor young man, he was only in his early 20s, um, they had a baby and the Spirit of the Lord showed me that the baby was not his. And uh, I literally saw the pastor's son. The Lord showed me an image and I told Sister Johnson, I said, did Kirk, whoops, did this fella, you know, did he ever wear his hair this certain way? Did he ever do this? And, and uh, what have you. And she looked at me and she said, my God, how on earth could you know that? And um, she said, yes, he did. And it, it actually had to do, I don't, when I say hair, I, I'm not even talking about just a haircut. I'm talking about frosting it and doing different things with it, you know, hair coloring and everything. And I said, you know, did he do this with his hair and blah, 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 because that's how the Lord showed him to me. And I saw him in a family photo and I saw him with this woman and blah, 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 blah. And I saw this child and, you know, and so anyway, there were so many facts, there were so many details in this story that the Spirit of the Lord showed me and he had me to share. And um, and the pastor that I shared, the, the witness that I gave the letter to, he came to me and he said, man, I've never seen anything like it. He said, my word, brother. There, he said, this thing is just packed with information that you couldn't know in a million years. And then Sister Johnson, who had known the fellow that died and the pastor and the family and blah, 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 she said the same thing. She said, oh my goodness, she said, brother, God had to give this to you, absolutely had to give this to you. So that gave me the courage then to give the pastor the letter. Now the letter was not meant to... Uh, there was a certain amount of rebuke in it, but it it basically, the, the Lord was just simply trying to say to this man, you know, um, I went to tremendous lengths to protect your son, you know, and to spare him a lot of pain and a lot of hurt. And there were all these factors involved that, as the years went by, it was just going to create more havoc and more uh, pain and more struggle for him. And, and he had already gone through some extremely difficult experiences, which the Lord showed me, which I had shared in the letter, um, dealing with some very deep, personal, intimate details of this young man's life. And every single item in that letter, according to two witnesses, um, they say everything in this letter is accurate to a T, to an absolute T. And so, you know, the Lord was just trying to remind this pastor, you know, instead of preaching that I do things that you don't approve of and you just need to learn to accept it, so to speak, you should be helping people to understand that sometimes the Lord will come to us because he knows the future. He knows uh, the struggle and the trouble and the, the hurts and the pains and the disappointments uh, that we're going to go through. And, uh, you know, he offers us options. They may be hard options, but he offers us options. Um, and, and I actually knew another lady that I've talked about in the past, Sister Chambers, um, little Holy Ghost filled powerhouse. My God Almighty, was she a powerhouse. And God actually did the same thing for her that he had done for this pastor. He came to her and showed her her son three times um, in repose. And he asked her, he said, will you release him to me? Because this kid had gone through hell on wheels and he had had a, 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 some really bad things, you know, in his life happen and, you know, 
was in a lot of pain and was struggling to serve the Lord. And um, honestly, it was on the verge of losing the battle spiritually, you know. And the Lord told her, said, if I take him now, uh, he'll be saved. And um, he'll be secure. He'll make heaven, you know. And she said, okay, Lord. And then literally a couple of weeks later, he was driving truck. And a couple of weeks later, her phone rang. And Sister Tamer said, I knew it was the call. She said, I she said, my phone had rung a hundred times between the Lord showing me that. She said, but that day when that phone rang, she said, I knew it was the call that my son was gone. And she picked up the phone and the police had called her to tell her her truck driving son had been in a wreck and that he died instantly in the accident. And so, you know, um, I'm trying to share the concept of a word of knowledge. There, the, a word of knowledge can come for any number of reasons. Sometimes it's just to give us direction. Sometimes it's to give us guidance. Sometimes it's to chasten or to chastise or to rebuke because we're kind of going off in the wrong direction. Uh, but in Acts chapter uh, 4 verses 33 through 37 and then again in Acts chapter 5 verses 1 through 11 I'm going to read these two sections together we have one of the best examples of a word of knowledge and that is the story of um, Ananias and Sapphira and with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great peace, grace was upon them all. Neither were there, was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the prices of the things that were sold, and laid them down at the apostles' feet, and distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. And Joseph, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite, and of the country of Cyprus, having, sold, having land, sold it, and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. So, uh, there were many people in the church who were poor. There were people in the church who were well-to-do. There were people in the church who had nothing. There were people in the church who had all kinds. And at this point in the early church, uh, many of the believers literally would take uh, excess properties and lands and houses and anything they own and they sold it and then they brought it and they gave it to the apostles and said here use this to meet the needs of of the saints that don't have you know that are lacking and uh, and then the apostles distributed it in order to help the believers and there was one man that was a landowner named Joseph who was a Levite from Cyprus sold his land, he brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, in verse 5, we read about a man named Ananias and his wife Sapphira. But a certain man named Ananias and Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? Whilst it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart. How in the world does Peter know this? You know, he's saying, 
How can you lie to the Holy Ghost? Why, how can you conceive this plan in your heart? You're presenting it to us, the apostles, as though you had done like everybody else. See, there are some people in the church, they want to act like they're doing like everybody else. But in reality, he was not selling this and giving it all to the apostles to be distributed. He was only given part. And Peter said to him, hey, it's yours. Yours to do with it as you please. You could bring whatever part you want to bring and say, here, Peter, you know, um, it's not the whole price of the property, but it's, you know what I'm saying? But he's going around the church trying to act like, Oh, yes, I'm doing what Joseph did. I'm doing like all the others did. You know, I'm selling this land and giving all the money to the apostles so it can be distributed. And uh, and so, uh, let me see. Why hast thou conceived this thing in thy heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost. And great fear came on all them that heard these things. And the young men arose, wound him up, and carried him out, and buried him. And it was about the space of three hours after, when his wife, not knowing what was done, came in. And Peter answered unto her, tell me whether ye sold the land for so much. In other words, he's saying, tell me, did you sell that land for a thousand dollars? As an example. And she said, yay, for so much. So she's in on the scheme. Instead of saying, well, no, Peter, we sold it for two thousand, but we kept a thousand, but we're giving a thousand. That's all she had to do. It was just, it, it had nothing to do with, um, they were required to give it all. No, Peter said, you weren't required to give it all. But why in the world are you going to stand here and lie to God and think that God is so foolish he cannot see what's going on? Uh, yea, for so much, then Peter said unto her, how is it that ye have agreed together to tempt the spirit of the Lord. Behold, the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door, and shall carry thee out. Then fell she down straightway at his feet, and yielded up the ghost, and the young men came in and found her dead, and carrying her forth, buried her by her husband. And great fear came upon all the church, and upon as many as heard these things. I'm going to tell you something, honey. When the Spirit of God use is a word of knowledge there's there's a lot of times uh, people don't want to be around that people don't uh-uh you, you don't want to be around where God may very well expose you for fraud where God may expose you for playing games and and, and not being honest and sincere um I was invited to preach quite a few years back now at a affirming church in Indiana. And uh, I talked to the pastor on the phone, and I told him he had gone through a church split. His church had split, and he was very disheartened and very upset and brokenhearted. And, and he called me. I didn't even know the man. He called me. And he said, you know, I just felt led to call you. And I was trying to comfort him and encourage him. And I told him, I said, listen, if you would like, I would be happy to come preach for you. See what I was talking about earlier about never getting a break and not having, you know. So I offered him, I said, I'll come preach for you if you'd like um, for a Sunday or whatever you'd like. I said, just to kind of give you a chance to take a break and to receive instead of putting out. And uh, I said, and I'll do it on my own dime. I'll pay for the trip myself. You don't have to worry about paying the airfare. You don't have to worry about paying for a rental car. You don't have to pay for nothing. 
I said, I, you know, I'll, I'll do it myself. I'll pay for everything. I said, the only thing that I ask is the word of God says the workman is worthy of his hire. And I said, if you'll take a love offering, and whatever that love offering amount is, whatever it is, I will take it and be happy with it. I said, I don't care if it only covers 10% of the cost of the trip, but I just, you know, that's the only thing I ask. And anybody who knows me knows when preachers come to our church, when ministers come to our church, we haven't had any in ages, um, but uh, when they have, uh, we always, I always strive to give them a really good, healthy love offering, okay? And so this man agreed. Well, long story short, I went. He wanted to want me to preach two nights, kind of do a little mini revival weekend. So on a Saturday and on a Sunday, I preached two nights for him. This guy had, in those services, we had like 30 people or better. He had way better than anything that, that I have now, certainly, and you know, than what we have in Dallas. We had two incredible services. Both nights he got up and made this big plea for people to give, to support Brother Charles for coming. You know, he's paying this on his own dime, but if we can at least make a, a good part of it, blah, 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 you know, blah, blah, blah. And he put out all this, and you know, oh, give, this is for Brother Charles, this is for Brother Charles. Well, when the time came at the end of it all for him to take me home to the airport to fly home. Um, he's driving me to the airport and he slips me this money. And I can't remember, now for some reason I can't remember what it was. But anyway, it's like two twenties and a 10, like $50 or something. And he gave me this money and I didn't look at it, I didn't count it, I didn't do nothing. I just put it in my pocket, you know, and I went to the airport. And then I have a habit, when I put money in my wallet, I never put money in my wallet without looking and counting it, because I want to know what I'm putting in my wallet, you know. Uh, otherwise, I could lose something or whatever, and wouldn't even know I lost it, because I didn't know what I put in there. So I took the money out of my pocket, and I was going to put it in my wallet, and I saw it was a 20 and two tens. And I went, I'm putting this in my wallet, and the Holy Ghost spoke to me and said, he did not give you the entire love offering. He agreed to, but he did not do it. So, uh, I called him after I got home. And I said, Brother, I just want to ask you a question. I said, um, the Lord showed me something. The Lord spoke to me about something. I said, you did not give me the, the whole love offering, did you? I said, you held back part of it. And to make a long story short, this guy literally wound up giving me about four different excuses, remember? He, he made up one excuse after another. Well, we needed to pay for the room because their church met in a, a motel uh, meeting room, you know. Well, we needed to pay for the motel meeting room, you know, uh, for the extra service because normally we do Sunday, but we don't do Saturday. But I added Saturday so we could have a little, you know, weekend, blah, blah, blah. And, well, first of all, you don't do that. You don't, you don't do that. Um, if I invite a preacher to come preach for us and I rent a space out for him to come preach, the love offering that I take for the preacher goes to the preacher. If I need to raise money to pay for the meeting space, and mind you, we made our arrangement a couple of months in advance. I didn't go preach for him for a couple, you know, it took a couple of months before I went up there to preach for him. So he could have raised the money to pay for that extra night, you know, and had that covered before I ever got there. And anyway, um, and then it went to, well, you know, 
uh, I had to pay for the room, and that's why I held that. And then it was another excuse, and then another, then another excuse. And then he got mad at me because I exposed this to him. To him, that I told him that, just like Ananias and Sapphira, you know, I'm telling him that he had done this, you know. And while I was there at his church, I stayed in the home of a transgendered lady that was a member of his church, a real sweet, precious person. And I stayed in her home, and... Um, Later, I had told her about it, you know, and because she was on the church board as well. And I told her, I said, you know, I had a talk with the pastor because I said, you know, he'd, he'd give me this. I said, but the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and said, he didn't give you the whole. And anyway, long story short, don't you know, it turns out, and this has happened to me many, 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 many times when I was evangelizing years ago, I've had, I can't count how many pastors have told me, we collected the best love offering for you that we've ever collected for any preacher that's ever visited our church. I don't know why it works that way. I don't, I don't know, but the Lord tends to move on the hearts of the people, you know, and they give really good love offerings for me. I don't know why that is, because they're taking the offering before they even heard me preach, you know. And so it's not like, oh, he's such a marvelous preacher. I'm going to give this great love offering. But somehow or another, you know, and it turns out that that's what happened in this situation, too. And the love offering was quite good, very ample. And it would have paid for about half the trip. That's all it would have paid for is about half the cost of the trip. But under the circumstances, especially at that time in our, in our financial life, because that was quite a few years back now, that would have helped a lot, you know, to, if, for it to have paid for half the trip. But anyway, so there are times, folks, I'm going to tell you, when a word of knowledge is present and uh, it can make people uncomfortable. You know, it can make people unhappy um, sometimes. And now a lot of times the word of knowledge, like I said, is, is to instruct people, you know, to, to give them direction when they don't know what direction to go in. And the Spirit of the Lord will say, I want you to tell them, um, that uh, don't make this move or don't do this or do do that or whatever, you know. Of course, the Lord gave me a word of knowledge one time for a lady. I was visiting a church that I'd never been to before. And she talked about finding a house that she wanted to buy. And w as she was testifying about this, the Holy Ghost spoke to me. I'll never forget it as long as I live. And the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and said, she don't want that house. She does not want that house. I don't know what was wrong with it. I don't know what the problem was. But the Lord spoke to me and said, you need to tell her she does not want that house. Well, I told her and she just looked at me like, you know, she didn't have no use for a word I had to say. She wanted that house. Well, I don't know what happened because, like I said, this wasn't a church I'd ever been to before, you know. Um, but there are times the Lord, try, you know, tries to warn us. And this is why I said earlier uh, in our study, this is why understanding the gifts of the Spirit and recognizing them is so important because I don't care how much I love this house that I found. If someone had come to me with a word of knowledge and told me, brother, the Lord spoke to me and told me to tell you, do not buy that house. That is not the right house. I would be able to discern whether or not this was from the Lord. Okay. 
And if it was from the Lord, you better good and bloody well know I'd have changed plans in a flat hurry. Okay? Um, because you don't, you know, Jesus said, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. The Spirit of the Lord is present in the church, folks, to help us have our best lives. You don't know how many mistakes God, by reason of a word of knowledge or a word of wisdom, you know, you don't know how many bad choices, bad mistakes, you know, that God can help us avoid if we'll listen. And the gifts of the Spirit are there for that purpose. The gifts of the Spirit are not there to irritate us and frustrate us. They're there to help us. And if we'll listen, if we'll listen, if that lady would have listened, I bet you a million dollars the Lord would have opened up something for her that was even better, that she'd have loved even more. But she would, she had her head and her heart so set on this particular property, but the Spirit of the Lord knew there was something going on there that should not be going on. Lastly, in the way of a word of knowledge tonight, I want to use another anecdote, another example. We're almost at the nine o'clock hour. Um, many, many years ago, a lady in the church that I knew, a wonderful holiness Pentecostal lady in the church of God, I adored this lady. She was just a precious, precious, precious Holy Ghost filled lady. And she had met a fella and uh, she had moved from Riverside Church and moved to another part of Texas where friends of hers were pastoring a church of God and she had moved up there to kind of help them. And uh, that's one of the things that makes me laugh. I, how many times um, people have moved halfway across the state or halfway across the country just to help a, a church. And this lady moved to help, you know, Brother and Sister Bruce with their church. And uh, anyway, when she moved, she met a fellow. She was, um, for many years, had been without a husband. She had some children, her uh, older daughters were old enough to be married and have families. She had a young daughter that was a teenager, a little bit younger than me. And uh, when I came to Texas, I was 16 and her youngest daughter probably was about 12 maybe at the time. So a year or so later, she met this fellow, she married him. And the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and told me that this man was he was uh, molesting this girl. And, uh, and the Lord spoke to me and he said, you need to go to that young lady and you need to tell her, I'm aware, God is aware of what's happening and know that he is about to bring this into the light so that this will end. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. You cannot know sometimes the comfort that comes just in the Spirit of the Lord letting you know unequivocally through a word of knowledge, I know where you're at, I know what you're going through, I know what you're experiencing. I'd give a million dollars to go visit a church somewhere and have somebody come up to me and say, the Lord spoke to me to tell you, I know it's been hard. I know you're struggling. I know you can't find people and blah, 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 and lay it out. Do you know what that would mean to me? If God spoke through somebody that way, that would mean the world to me, okay? Uh, so I went to this young lady and I told her, and I, you know, gave a little more information so she knew specifically I was talking about um, the situation with her stepfather. And she looked at me at the time like a deer in the headlights. 
and she really didn't respond at all. She literally didn't respond. She just looked at me like a deer in the headlights. And I didn't live where they lived. I had gone up there and preached for, for Brother and Sister Bruce on any number of occasions. And um, so I never did hear, you know, how things panned out with that. Years passed, and for years I felt horrible because I was like, oh dear God, did I speak out of turn? Did I say the wrong thing? Did I, was that just me and it wasn't you? You know, I get nervous about things like that because I don't ever want to speak out of turn. And I was so concerned that maybe I had misspoken and here I am telling this girl, the Lord knows your stepdad's, done, you know, <laughs> and you know, I could have looked like a real nutcase, you know. Well, anyway, years passed and years passed and years passed and year, decades. It took nearly 30 years or better for me to finally, finally, finally learn from my cousin who is friends with the one of the or a couple of the adult daughters you know who were married and everything when I first came to Texas those are her friends that she's known for decades and we happened to be talking one day and I asked her I said by any chance is sister so-and-so still married to that fellow she was married to and my cousin said uh, no, they're, you know, they're, they're not together anymore. Blah, blah. And long story short, my cousin told me, she said, uh, it turns out that he was molesting the daughter. And the, um, somehow or another, this lady had come into knowledge of this and it was discovered and of course she protecting her daughter immediately separated from this man you know and Tommy can tell you because he was there when she told me I almost shouted through the rafters of the building we were in not because I, by any means I was happy this had happened but because I had been a nervous wreck for decades that maybe I had misspoken and then lo and behold, finally, after all those years, I got confirmation. Now, you didn't misspeak. You were right on the money. Every word that came off your lips was right on the money. So at least I know when I spoke those words to her, she may have had absolutely no reaction that I could see. But I know that in her heart, she knew Thank you, Jesus. God just let me know that he knows what's going on. And of course, the situation like that is so personal and, and intimate and embarrassing and humiliating. You know, I'm sure she wouldn't want to blurt out, yes, you know, he, you know, or whatever. He's doing this, this, that. So anyway, those are just some examples of how uh, a word of knowledge, you know, with Ananias and Sapphira, the Lord exposed their deceit with a word of knowledge. Um, I've had similar experiences myself. Um, but at the same time, sometimes the Lord speaks comfort to us. Sometimes the Lord speaks uh, encouragement. Sometimes he speaks direction. Whatever he speaks, uh, in the end, it is all for the purpose of our good. And... Um, the Lord doesn't, you know, there, it never, ever does God speak anything just to be malicious or just to be, you know, hateful or nasty. No, if it's a word of knowledge, then there is some good to come from it. If nothing else, it's a rebuke so that we can learn to act right, you know, and to do right. Uh, but there's no malice or... Uh, negativity attached to it. All right, my friends, that sums up our time for this evening. Next week, we are going to look, we're going to begin to really delve next week into the issue of prophecy. Now, this issue is going to have a whole lot more scripture, a whole lot more um, 
meat to it, okay? We're going to look at many aspects of prophecy. Uh, we are going to look at uh, the concept of, of true prophets and false prophets, knowing a true prophecy from a false prophecy. We're going to look at, at examples of prophecy in Scripture. Uh, we are going to understand exactly what the nature of prophecy is because I'm going to tell you right now, Many people in the church today really don't know. They think they know, but they, they don't have a clue. Prophecy is not predicting the future. That is not, uh, there are times when, when that is part of a prophecy. But the, the, the function and the nature of prophecy is very specific. And we're going to look at that beginning next week, okay? And so I think you'll really enjoy that, and I think you'll really benefit from that. And then lastly, we're going to be looking at uh, prophecy in the sense of um, this is one of the gifts of the Spirit that actually comes with an office. So in other words, prophecy is not merely something that it can be something that operates through people as the as the gift but by the same token the the gift also can be the office of prophet so that someone actually occupies a prophetic office okay and we're going to look at that as well let's close our bible study tonight with prayer i've gone a few minutes over time uh, I will remind you the video that we're going to share on YouTube of tonight's Bible study. I always edit out the first half hour or so, whatever time I take, just to talk about different things while people come and, and get in and get involved in our uh, live broadcast. I always edit that out so that when I share the video of the Bible study, um, it only will begin exactly where the Bible study begins, okay? So it won't be two hours long. It'll only be like, you know, um, maybe 80 minutes or so. All right. Father, we love you. We thank you, God, tonight for this time in the Word of God. We thank you, Lord, for the gifts of the Spirit. We thank you, Lord, that you are real and you operate in the church, through the church, for the benefit of your people. Master, in the name of Jesus, help us, Lord, to meditate upon that which we've heard tonight. Help us, Lord, to understand it, to grasp it. Lord, today, to um, learn to recognize when the gifts of the Spirit are in operation. And to be grateful, Lord, when you're trying to help us, instruct us, inspire us, encourage us, or even on those occasions, Lord, when you feel the need to chasten us so that we might improve uh, our conduct and our behavior. Master, in the name of Jesus, I pray, God, that you would go with us from this place as always. Keep us under your mighty hand. And keep us safe in this dangerous world in which we live. Help us, Lord, to do a work for you in this place. Let us see a mighty Holy Ghost filled on fire church rise up in this location. Lord, where the gifts of the Spirit are in operation, where people are passionate about their faith and passionate about living the Christian life as you would have it to be lived, filled with love, compassion, mercy, and grace. Help us to be a witness and a testimony for the time is coming short in which the church is going to be able to do an active, effective work of evangelism. Master, today, bless those who have watched with us let them go from this place with the peace of God and the joy of the Holy Ghost. For we ask it in none other than Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. All right, folks, I hope you'll join us Sunday 
at 3 o'clock Central Standard Time and uh, for a celebration of life in Christ. And then, of course, next Wednesday at 7 o'clock Central Standard Time for our midweek Bible study. God bless you in Jesus' name is our prayer.